Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the second last lecture on Look Back in Anger by John Osborne. So we've already had a few discussions on this, a few lectures on this particular drama where we discuss certain aspects of gender studies, masculinity studies, uh, the very complex relationship between the political perspective and the gendered behavior in Look Back in Anger. Uh, so I hopefully given you an idea of the cultural condition which produced this play, the political backdrop of this play. Uh, you know the, the the politics of anger, the politics of melancholy, the politics of masculinity, which pervades this particular play. And more specifically, we looked at a particular scene uh, in the previous lecture, if you remember, where we have seen, we have studied actually the conversation between Alison Redfern and her father, Colonel Redfern, which revolved around Jimmy Porter. Uh, we talked about how uh, Colonel Redfern represented or embodied a particular kind of masculinity. Uh, the colonial imperial masculinity, which is obviously on its way out. It doesn't understand the world around it. Uh, you know, it's obviously not hegemonic anymore. It's not dominant anymore. Uh, it's confused. Uh, it's completely contaminated by different kinds of cultural factors. Uh, and obviously, we have Jimmy Porter, who is a post-imperial kind of British masculinity, who never was uh, hegemonic, never was dominant. Uh, and he sort of, uh, in a very strange way, the two figures seem to have some kind of an empathetic relationship with each other. Uh, both understand, they seem to understand each other's disillusionment. So Jimmy says at one point that it must be, uh, you know, it must be a really bitter feeling for someone like Redfern uh, to have fallen from grace, to have fallen from a certain dominant position which he once enjoyed uh, as an imperial officer in India. Uh, and in, in his turn, Colonel Redfern seems to empathize with Jimmy uh, and he actually tells Alison that uh, I sort of understand how Jimmy must be feeling at this point of time. Uh, where well, we have this very interesting line said by Alison, where he, where she tells her father that uh, you are, you know, you are, you are disillusioned, you are angry, you are confused because uh, everything has changed. Jimmy is confused because nothing has changed. Uh, something must have gone wrong somewhere. And this, I, this particular line, which I picked up in the previous lecture, is a very political line because it sort of captures the entire uh, cynicism, disillusion, uh, and discontent. Uh, that provides look back in anger. The, the political scenario, the political backdrop of look back in anger is one of discontent, right? And it's against this discontented political backdrop that we must study the different gender behaviors, the different gender embodiments in look back in anger. Uh, what kind of masculinity does uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Porter represent? What kind of femininity does Alison Redfern represent? What kind of femininity does uh, Helena Charles represent? Uh, the middle class manipulative uh, kind of femininity which vacillates between a Christian belief system uh, and a completely anti-Christian, uh, anti-religious belief system and how she sort of balances the two acts. And obviously a big part of Look Back in Anger is, you know, if you're looking at a play from a, from a gender perspective, a big part of Look Back in Anger is a performative perspective. Uh, to what extent do characters play role within their roles? So Jimmy Porter, it, it, oftentimes in the play, you find him breaking into different kinds of roles. So he obviously represents a certain kind of, uh, you know, a certain kind of masculinity in Look Back in Anger. But even within the play, the, frequently, you know, he sort of breaks into uh, caricatures of different kinds of masculinity, a genteel masculinity, working class masculinity, uh, you know, revolutionary masculinity, radical masculinity, conservative masculinity. He performs the different roles, often parodies the different roles. So again, this very slippery relationship between performativity and parody, which, you know, goes on and look back in anger, is something which we must pay attention to, especially if we're reading this particular play from a gender studies perspective. Now, uh, what I'll do today is sort of hopefully giving you a preamble to the play, hopefully giving you an understanding of the, polit the politics of masculinity and femininity in the play. What I'll do today is look at the way in which the drama in Look Back in Anger, the, 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 the plot in Look Back in Anger, the dramatic plot in Look Back in Anger, to what extent uh, is that particular plot gendered. So we talk about the relationship between affect and gender. 
Uh, so, for instance, when I say affect, I, I include anger, I include uh, violence, I include uh, disrespect, I include insult, I include you know, you know feeling uh, violated. So, all these are different kinds of affect. So, let's look at someone like uh, Alison Redfern or Alison Porter in Look Back in Anger. To what extent is a femininity uh, a construct of effect. So, Alison Redfern can be seen in Look Back in Anger as a vessel of violence. Right? So, she is someone and I am not, not talking about violence only at a physical corporeal level, but also at an epistemic level, uh, at a level of knowledge. That is why I use the word epistemic. Uh, so, she represents or she embodies uh, a departure from a certain kind of knowledge system into another kind of knowledge system which you cannot, which she cannot uh, quite come to terms to. So, uh, if you look at a background of Alison Redfern, she obviously grew up uh, in an imperial setting. She grew up in India uh, as a daughter of an imperial officer stationed in India. Uh, and then of course, she had to come back to England after India gained independence. And once she came back to England, uh, she could not understand her own country. So, ethnically she is British, uh, you know nationally she is British, but she, when she comes back to India, she cannot quite recognize Britain around her because she has never been there. She grew up in India, uh, entirely in India and she is very used to a certain kind of Britishness, a certain kind of British femininity, uh, which is at odds to what the kind of femininity she is having to perform in England. So, if you look at her kind of embodiment, uh, the kind of femininity embodied by Alison Redfern and Look Back in Anger, you will find quite clearly that she is someone who becomes a vessel for violence. So, she becomes uh, a receiver of violence from different kinds of perspectives. So, she comes back to England uh, and she does not quite recognize it, she does not quite fit into it uh, and she finds the entire genteel uh, you know, scenario, the genteel society around them uh, to be quite stifling and claustrophobic uh, and that sort of makes her even more paranoid and that sort of makes her uh, almost uh, you know desperate to depart from this kind of discourse, uh, wherein comes in Jimmy Porter, uh, you know who appears to her as a swashbuckling uh, radical uh, man and for which uh, she sort of completely falls headlong uh, and then she marries him against her parents wishes, uh, you know departing from the family, breaking away from the family norms completely, breaking away from the kind of middle class uh, you know normative Britishness that she is so used to accustomed to living. Uh, and she marries Jimmy and she sort of settles down or tries to settle down as a working class uh, housewife, a working class homemaker. Now, obviously, that does not work out and I keep saying you uh, know the different uh, one of the many things which makes uh, which make look back in anger such a complex play is a collusion between gender and class in look back in anger. So, you know if you look at someone like Ma Tana uh, who is the mother of Hugh Tana in look back in anger, she represents or she embodies a pure working class woman. Uh, who is sort of quote unquote ignorant, uh, does not quite know, is not quite switched on about the worldly affairs around her and obviously, she is someone who Jimmy adores, uh, but she also represents to a certain extent the dying uh, purity of the working class. So, there is no pure class left in, in Look Back in Anger. So, there is no pure working class, this divide between the pure working class and the pure middle class is completely disappearing in Look Back in Anger. And obviously, uh, Alison, uh, you know, Hugh Tanner's mother, uh, Ma Tanner, represents uh, you know that kind of a dying class, that dying embodiment. So, and very symbolically, she dies in Look Back in Anger. Uh, and, and her funeral, her death in Look Back in Anger is a very symbolic death, like the death of Jimmy Porter's father. Uh, again, we don't, we never get to know the name of the person, but we, we get to know that he has been, he had been to the Spanish Civil War, came back as a broken man, uh, ideologically broken, medically broken, uh, and you know, spent the rest of his life as a cynical, sick man. So, again, this, uh, this, this entanglement between cynicism and sickness in Look Back in Anger is interesting. And you know, we talked about how uh, Jimmy Porter's misogyny and you know, the kind of hatred he has for a woman uh, it sort of stems from to a certain extent uh, you know the trauma uh, the childhood trauma he had experienced uh, listening to his dying father uh, you know rattling off about his unsuccessful life this failure of a life uh, from his deathbed and the fact that he attended to him uh, for 10 months listening to him uh, you know this broken man illogically broken man cynical man sick man that sort of informed this misogyny and obviously there were no women around him at that point in time so this absent mother figure and look back in anger is, is again a very complex you know absent presence uh, so, she is there uh, by not being there in other words. So, and uh, of course, we talked about how this connects Jimmy Porter with someone like Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet because you know again in Hamlet we find a certain kind, a certain degree of misogyny which comes uh, from the mistrust of the woman. Uh, Hamlet cannot trust the woman, Hamlet is sort of uh, you know threatened by the woman you know. So, we find uh, him vacillating between uh, you know the, the sort of being the son of a woman 
to being the lover of a woman and, and can't quite come to terms with it. It's sort of imbalance as a man in that way. And I find a certain, you know, similar kind of imbalance in Jimmy Porter as well. He's a very flawed character. And the complexity of the character lies in this flaw. Uh, you know, the fact that he's so flawed makes him a very complex character. He's not really what you'd call a seamlessly manly man. So his masculinity or his manliness is something uh, you know, is sort of thwarted by his many hesitations, his neurotic behavior, uh, and his ambivalence about different aspects of life. And of course, the class question keeps coming back and Jimmy Porter as well. So we keep saying how he wants to dress up, uh, he wants to sort of, there's an aspirational quotient about the way he talks, about the way he dresses, the way he smokes his pipe, uh, the way he reads his newspapers, the way he listens to Vaughan Williams, so a very British composer. So all these things come together to make him uh, some kind of an aspirational embodiment. So he is someone who's been to university, he's obviously got the rhetoric of an educated man, uh, but he doesn't obviously have the, the real substance to be middle class. So he's someone who's torn between being a working class and being a middle class. He can't go back being a working class person because, you know, he's too educated for it and he can't be a pure a middle class as well because he doesn't have the financial resources to be middle class as well. So again, this imbalance, this hesitation, this ambivalence, this sort of in-betweenness uh, between two kinds of domains is what makes Jimmy Porter a very, very complex character. So again, coming back to Alison Redfern, so she can be seen as someone who's a, you know, who's a receiver of violence. So she receives violence from her father, from her husband, from the society around her, uh, and she's sort of is someone who's completely confused. So she's probably the most confused character in Look Back in Anger. Uh, and obviously, she doesn't have the rhetoric of Jimmy. Despite being uh, you know, purely genteel, despite being really genteel, she doesn't have to go to university to be genteel. She was born into gentility. Uh, she doesn't quite have the rhetoric of Jimmy Porter, uh, and so she, she becomes this very passive recipient of violence. And we find this degree of this, this, this vacillation between uh, verbal violence and visceral violence is something which happens in the back in anger quite often. And uh, the body of the woman becomes, you know, the site of violence. Uh, so Jimmy takes out his frustration, Jimmy takes out his anger of the world against the world, his cynicism against the world, his frustration against the world. Um, you know, he takes it out on the woman, on his wife. And again, we find this, you know, this is a very long tradition of male behavior, taking out violence on the woman. So, you know, Alison Redfern becomes a way of the abused woman. So her body is abused, her presence is abused, her class is abused, her embodiment is abused, uh, her very uh, identity is abused in the back in anger to a great extent. Uh, and obviously, uh, she comes back having lost a child. She comes back, you know, possibly, uh, you know, with, you know, she, she possibly there's a, there's a hint of that that she can't probably become a mother again. So she comes back with a certain degree of sickness, a certain degree of you know, a medical condition in her, which makes her uh, sort of traditional femininity sort of compromised to a certain extent. So, you know, her, her, the, the abuse of Alison Redfern and Jimmy Porter, the violence against Jimmy, uh, Alison Redfern and Jimmy Porter is verbal, is visceral, is medical, is cultural, and is deeply political as well. So she is someone who's completely unprotected. Uh, so she's not protected by her father, she's not protected by her husband, she's not protected by anyone. Uh, and, you know, if you leave aside this very stereotypical idea of the protected woman as well, she's someone who cannot articulate uh, her ang ang anguish, she cannot articulate her identity uh, in a straightforward way as well, because she lives in a very complex time uh, in which her identity as an imperial woman uh, will be immediately challenged and questioned. And on the other hand, she doesn't really have, uh, unlike her father, she doesn't really have a glorious identity to fall back upon. So she sort of grew up in India as a daughter of a, uh, um, the colonial officer, but you know, she, she never quite, uh, did not really quite come to terms with power, with prestige, with you know, dominance, with any kind of cultural identity. So she's someone of a floating signifier, uh, if you may say that, right? Uh, and obviously her end is quite tragic. She comes back to Jimmy Porter, having lost a child, uh, she comes back to Jimmy Porter uh, with the, the possibility that she probably had lost the ability to become a mother again. So she comes back uh, in a bodily abuse, she comes back in a medical condition, and she comes back completely broken. So again, if you look at the femininity of uh, Alison Redfern and, and, and look back in anger, it's a femininity which is sort of constructed by violence epistemic violence, verbal violence, and visceral violence. If you look at the rhetoric of Jimmy, uh, which is directed against Alison, it's a very violent rhetoric. So the, the words are very violent, right? It is intended that to hurt her. It's intended to insult her. It's intended to intimidate her. And we can do a very fine study of the rhetoric of Jimmy Porter 
uh, some kind of a masculine strategy, uh, some kind of a male strategy to attack the woman, right? So in order to attack the woman, you don't really have to be visceral all the time, you don't really have to be bodily all the time. Although it does become visceral at some point, if you remember uh, in the very opening of Lubeck and Anger, the first act, which contains a scene where Jimmy and, and, and Cliff they start this mock wrestling thing and they tumble into Alison, uh, who, sort of, who, who happened to be ironing Jimmy's shirt at that point in time, and a very hot iron sort of brushed against her arm, which burned her arm. And again, obviously, that becomes a very clear example of physical violence in Lubeck and Anger, which had stemmed from you know, this, this, this very violent rhetoric. So again, this, this you know, vacillation between verbal and visceral violence in Lubeck and Anger is quite interesting. So the body of the woman becomes a site of violence, rhetorical violence, bodily violence, cultural violence, medical violence, all kinds of violence happen in Lubbock and Anger, and the site of violence happens to be Alison Redfern. So she is someone uh, who doesn't really have you know, the, the, the grief of uh, Jimmy Porter, you know, because, you know, Jimmy uses um, his anger as some kind of a strategy. Uh, it's almost like a license for him uh, to, you know, scream out to the world. And at one, what point of the play, at what point of the play, um, you know, Alison tells that don't take away his anger from him. Uh, he'll be lost without him. So the anger of Jimmy Porter becomes almost an apparatus, right? It's not just something it does at a human level, but also something it does at a discursive level. It's something which gives them a, a sort of a platform to lash out to the world, uh, a sort of a platform to scream out his anguish. So again, uh, and the rhetoric of Jimmy Porter is very cleverly engineered kind of rhetoric. It's very cleverly constructed rhetoric. Uh, it's, it's sort of deliberately designed to be hurtful, to be insulting, to be intimidating, to be violent, right? So what I'm trying to say through this sort of last 10 minutes is the fact that you know, just like we looked at the gendered quality of knowledge in, in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, one needs to look at the gendered quality of rhetoric in Look Back in Anger. The, the, the rhetoric of Jimmy, of Jimmy Porter is a very male, violent rhetoric, which is deliberately designed to hurt the woman, uh, to sort of inflict violence on the woman, right? And if you look at the very, very graphic bodily images that Jimmy Porter uses, especially when he's talking about um, his mother-in-law uh, as being this sort of, uh, this very rotten body inside the system that worms are feeding in. It's very graphic, it's very, you know, it's very disturbing, it's very, very physical, it's very shocking, uh, and it's obviously it's very violent, right? You know, just trying to imagine a body of a woman uh, inside a cistern, a drain, which is being uh, sort of eaten by worms, right? And that's not really uh, uh, an edifying image at all. It's something which is deeply depressing, disturbing, uh, and sort of violent and a very visceral verbal level. So again, this, this deliberate entanglement between the visceral and the verbal in Lubbock and Anger is something that happens at a very gendered level as well. So Alison Redfern becomes the site of violence in Lubbock and Anger. She becomes the receiver of violence, uh, you know, uh, violence you know, against her class, against her body, against her identity, against her appearance, against her language, all kinds of violence are directed against her. Now, if you come to Helena Charles from here, now who is Helena Charles in Lubbock and Anger and what is her gendered performative identity in Lubbock and Anger. It's a very complex question because remember, the first thing we need to know about Helena Charles is that she's a professional actress. Uh, she has come to London, uh, especially, you know, she's touring, uh, uh, she's sort of in the theatre company, touring London, and she apparently did not have a place to stay, so she sort of got in touch with Alison and moved into their apartment. And we see from the very beginning of Look Back in Anger, the moment Helena walks in to Jimmy Porter's household, we get to know that Jimmy hates Helena naturally. So he describes her as one of his natural enemies, because she represents the voice of establishment, the voice of middle class establishment, uh, the voice of middle class morality, the voice of middle class rhetoric, right? So she represents that value system, that establishment, that, you know, belief system. So she's deeply Christian as well. Uh, and at one point she takes Alison to the church on a Sunday uh, against Jimmy's wish. And that's a very symbolic scene because that's the scene also where Jimmy comes back having heard the news of, you know, Hugh Tanner's mother's stroke. So he wants Alison to come with him uh, to the funeral or to see, pay the last respects to Hugh Tanner's mother. But obviously Alison chooses to go to the church with Helena, which of course is a very symbolic choice, a very symbolic move, a very political move. So going to the church on a Sunday is going to the establishment, is going to uh, sort of desiring to be accommodated by the establishment, right? Moving away from the anti-establishment that Jimmy wants to uh, embody. So that becomes a very symbolic defeat for uh, Jimmy Porter, okay? So that scene is a very symbolic scene where um, sort of Helena is seen dragging Alison, uh, seducing Alison to go back to the establishment, to go back to the church. And of course, she's instrumental in writing a letter to Alison's father 
advising him to come and pick her up. So you know, Helena, in many ways, till this point, can be described, can be classified as this very middle class Christian presence in Lubbock and Angab, who is obviously uh, antagonistic uh, to Jimmy Porter's anti-establishment radical rhetoric. She can't quite come to terms with it, uh, although we get to know very soon later, subsequently, that she is seduced by it. Right? So she's someone who's tempted by it. She's someone who's, who finds it deeply erotic uh, at many levels. So you find that particular scene where uh, you know, Jimmy comes back after the departure of Alison and Helena and Jimmy. They have a very uh, interesting uh, you know, episode where uh, they move from uh, physical you know, disgust and hatred to lust very, very quickly. Right? So you find that you know, uh, you know, Alison slaps Jimmy and Jimmy wants to slap her back but he cannot. And then of course Alison pulls her, pulls him to her and they start kissing passionately. So then the, dramatic, the dramaticity of that scene, the, the, the immediacy of the scene is a fact, lies on the fact that how quickly it spills over into a completely uh, different kind of desire. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a kind of uh, you know, uh, fascination from disgust to desire that we see in Look Back in Anger. Now, at the very beginning of the play, we had seen how Jimmy Porter was described as someone who is the you know, constructive opposites, the constructive contradictions. So we find the same kind of contradictions uh, coming together, uh, even at the level of effect. So again, from disgust to desire, you know, from hatred to lust, uh, you know, from you know, a deeply worshipping kind of rhetoric to a deeply uh, you know, violent kind of rhetoric. Uh, and again, if you look at the relationship between Jimmy and Colonel Redfern, we find that there's you know, a degree of empathy even you know, beneath the antagonism that the two men have for each other. Okay? So all that is there in Look Back and Anger at a very gendered level. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do today in this lecture is look at the aim, the very gendered quality of rhetoric in Look Back in Anger, how male is the anger in Look Back in Anger, and how deliberately designed is it in terms of language. So the linguistic design uh, of the hatred, of the hate speech, if you sort of use that particular phrase in Look Back in Anger, is a very male kind of hate speech, which is directed obviously against the woman, against the body of the woman. And the, the woman is attacked over and over again uh, in Look Back in Anger. So all the women who attack in Look Back in Anger is Alison Redfern, Alison Redfern's mother, uh, who is sort of described as this, you know, very graphically as this massive body which is being eaten by worms. And of course, the, the other woman uh, who, you know, we have uh, Martana, Hugh Tanner's mother, who dies in the back in anger, and Jimmy Porter's mother, who never appears in the play uh, except as a passing presence, as a passing reference, and a very, very unpleasant reference made by Jimmy. So where he says that, you know, his mother was never there for him uh, at a time where he needed him, uh, her the most. So, you know, the, the woman in Lubbock and Anger, they have a very complex symbolism in the play. Now, the, the one woman who stands out uh, among all the other figures in Lubbock and Anger is Helena Charles. Now, uh, and again, as I mentioned just a little while earlier, and also I believe I had mentioned this before in some of the lectures previously as well, that one needs to remember that Helena Charles is a, is a professional actress. So, performativity is something which comes naturally to her. So, she's here to act in a particular play. And she sort of gets into the Porter household, uh, you know. And the first appearance we have of her is that of a, uh, you know, middle-class model woman. Uh, and, but obviously, that quick, quickly changes into something which is not middle-class, something which is manipulative, something which is, you know, seductive, and something, you know, she becomes a woman who is quite content uh, in being uh, Jimmy's mistress. She has absolutely no qualms about him until the point that Alison comes back. And when Alison comes back to the Porter household. So Helena goes back suddenly into becoming the model woman again. And she sort of expresses and articulates the fact that she uh, realizes what she had done is wrong and morally incorrect and unchristian. So again, it's very complex. So on the one hand, she starts off being this model Christian woman, uh, and then she goes back uh, and she breaks away from it uh, and becomes Jimmy's mistress. And the two share a very erotic relationship, which has got nothing to do with the value system or the middle class morality. But then after Alison's reappearance in the play, uh, Helena very quickly goes back and converts into this Christian middle class model woman. So again, the, the, and that brings us to the uh, topic, the other topic which we, I intend to cover in this play, the relationship between morality and gender in Look Back in Anger. So to what extent is morality gendered in Look Back in Anger, right? So we have, on the one hand, uh, Jimmy Porter, who really and seemingly doesn't really care about morality or middle class morality. So she, he, he supposed, he's supposed to have his own private morals. And that's what we keep saying, that's what we keep knowing about Jimmy. And you know, other people tell the same thing about him, that he, he has his own private moral system, which has got nothing to do with the Christian system or the middle class system whatsoever. But then again, we have 
the woman in look back in anger. So we have Helena Charles who starts up being this model woman and goes back and being this sort of erotic seductress, the femme fatale, and then of course uh, you know she converts into this model Christian woman again at the end of the play. Now. The character in Lubbock and Anger, I think, uh, is very complex in terms of the morality, is obviously you know, Alison Redford. Now, Alison, as we know, uh, she grew up uh, in this sort of very privileged imperial household, this very privileged imperial family, uh, you know, and she was very used to being waited upon. Uh, and then suddenly she finds himself, herself married to this uh, working class hero, or someone who wants to be a working class hero. But obviously, he's a very violent man, someone who's misogynistic, someone who uh, you know, carries his childhood trauma with him, uh, someone who subjects her to violence repeatedly. Right? So she finds her in a, in, a, in a bit of no man's land. And obviously, she also refers to Hugh Tanner, uh, the more extreme version of Jimmy Porter, someone who doesn't appear in the play, Hugh Tanner, but we get to know of him, that he's a deeply violent man uh, who would put Jimmy to shame in terms of violence, in terms of this very masculine rhetoric of rage that Jimmy Porter has. So Hugh Tanner is a more extreme embodiment and a more extreme extension of Jimmy Porter in, in several ways. Right? And again, we don't see him in the play. We don't really, he doesn't appear in the play except as a passing reference. So he's among the many characters who don't appear in the play, including uh, you know, Jimmy Porter's father, Jimmy Porter's mother, uh, you know, Alison's mother, you know, uh, you know, Ma Tanner, uh, and of course, Jimmy's dead child. Uh, who sort of appears and disappears and doesn't quite appear in the world, but he is sort of, the child is there as a symbolic non-presence at the end of the play, right? Uh, the fact that the child doesn't appear and makes a certain kind of appearance and tells a certain kind of symbolic um, articulation in the context of the play, right? So that's something which we need to be careful about uh, in the end as well. So the, 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 the dead child of Jimmy Porter, to what extent is the dead child symbolic? To what extent is the uh, non-appearance of the dead child a gendered phenomenon, right? To what does it say uh, about uh, the play, the politics of the play, the politics, the predicament of the play, the human predicament of the play? Uh, so does it point to a certain kind of futurelessness, uh, uh, a certain kind of human condition which is premised on futurelessness? Or does it sort of uh, you know, have some of the political suggestion in terms of imperial and post-imperial England? And there's something which is open-ended, I mean, never quite know, but it definitely points to a certain kind of closure that the two, Jimmy Porter and Alison Redfern, they, they go back uh, playing the bear and squirrel game again. Uh, you know. And of course, the bear and squirrel game is a deeply gendered game as well, as we have discussed already, and we will discuss it further as we go on. But the dead child is a very symbolic non-presence in Look Back in Anger. It does say a lot by not appearing uh, at all in the course of the play. Right. Now, there are other characters which we had discussed in the back in anger and the people who play certain symbolic roles in terms of gendered identity, one of which is obviously uh, Nigel Redfern, uh, someone who is an embodiment of entitlement, someone who is just born in this wealthy family and you know that's the only privilege that he has acquired, uh, you know the, the privilege of birth and that gives him, that guarantees him a ticket to the parliament, that guarantees him uh, a privileged access to politics uh, which someone like Jimmy Porter would never have despite uh, all the talents that Jimmy might have. So, one wonders to what extent would Jimmy have been a successful or a good politician if he had a chance. But of course, he never had a chance because he, he sort of stuck in this no man's land between the working class and the genteel class, which he cannot be, which he can never become the genteel class. So, you know, look back in anger is, is a very complex model of all these different issues. It's a model of class, gender, and politics, rhetoric. Um, you know, sentiments. So all these things come together and look back in anger and make it a deeply complex play, play especially if you're looking at it from a gender studies perspective, right? Now, uh, the other thing I want to move on today uh, is uh, we've we covered the relationship between gender and rhetoric. We covered the relationship between gender and class earlier. We covered the relationship between gender and sentiment earlier. So, so to what extent uh, is sentiment gendered in Lubbock and Anger? So we, we've spoken, we have spoken about how anger is a very male sentiment in Lubbock and Anger. So only the males seem to have access to anger. So Jimmy Porter uh, is sort of consumed by anger and he consumes anger in return. So anger is something of a commodity that he has. Right? It stems from his grief, it stems from his sorrow, it stems from his uh, sort of strategic sorrow, you might say. Uh, to, to, so to, to a certain extent, we might compare him with uh, Mansfield's boss, 
in, in, in the fly. Uh, so again, who is someone who is uh, reliant on a strategic sorrow in order to articulate his kind of masculinity, right? So he's strategically sorrowful, he's strategically sad, uh, because that gives him access to a certain kind of masculinity which he wants to produce and perpetuate in the course of the short story. Now, look back and I got a similar kind of condition. So we have, uh, you know, L uh, Jimmy Porter, who is strategically sorrowful, who is someone who is, you know, uh, angry all the time, but we never quite know to what extent is his anger constructed. Uh, to what extent is anger a really organic condition or is it a cultural condition or is it a combination of the cultural and the organic? Is it a combination of the even logical, the cultural and the organic, right? Because you know, it's very interesting to see how quickly he, he loses his anger as well. So when he's very angry at Alison and he flares at her and uh, that particular scene where he jumps into her and you know, she burns her arm in the iron, the hot iron. We see him very quickly becoming childlike. We see him very quickly becoming infantilized. So he again immediately becomes very concerned with Alison's hand. You know, uh, he becomes very concerned with Alison's hurt, his, her pain. So all the anger that he had had just prior to the scene disappears immediately, right? So again, that begs the question: To what extent is Jimmy Porter's anger, uh, you know, natural and organic? Or is it just a rhetorical strategy, uh, you know, a strategy of procrastination, a strategy of denial, a strategy of privilege? Because you know, the anger gives him a certain kind of privilege. You know, uh, if you remember King Lear, which has this interesting line called "Anger hath a privilege," and that's something that, that's something we need to remember if you read Look Back in Anger as well, because anger does have a certain kind of privilege in Look Back in Anger, uh, you know, in a very King Learish kind of a way. But of course, with Jimmy Porter, he's just the antithesis of King Lear. He's someone who's not been in a dominant position. He's someone who's never been in a position of privilege. So he doesn't know what privilege is. So you know, he can only aspire uh, for privilege. He can only aspire for dominance through anger. So anger becomes a male strategy of aspiration. It's like Jimmy Porter's torn tweed jacket, um, sort of the pipe he's smoking, uh, and the new sort of world that he's reading. So all these things come together metonymically uh, to construct a certain kind of masculinity uh, that he aspires to become, a genteel kind of masculinity, despite his working class privilege, a working class background. Okay? So we talked about that uh, to a great extent earlier as well. Now, uh, if you look at the other minor characters in Look Back in Anger, uh, for instance, Colonel Redfern is someone, you know, he doesn't have to be uh, aspirational, doesn't have to have, doesn't need this, doesn't have this anxiety uh, to be, you know, aspirational because he is automatically guaranteed uh, a license uh, and a location and gentility because of his birth, because of his colonial background. Right? So that makes him, uh, interestingly, a genteel person. But then again, we, we discuss how that also makes him more confused cognitively and politically. Because you know, he comes back to an England he doesn't recognize. He comes back to an England where his authority is increasingly questioned. Uh, no longer does he have any kind of privileged location in his England. Uh, it's a post imperial England. And that makes him uh, sort of a minority to a certain extent. So again, we have this very interesting move from being a hegemonic masculine, masculine presence to a minor presence who is increasingly challenged and questioned uh, and marginalized uh, in that kind of a class structure. So if you take, I mean we have already discussed all this and now if you just move on and uh, plunge into the, so the last bit of the play where uh, Anna, uh, Helena Charles becomes Jimmy's mistress and we see them uh, establish a very erotic relationship where uh, they seem to be quite happy with each other at a pure level of lust uh, and Jimmy doesn't seem to expect much from Helena, uh, you know, certainly not to the extent to which he had expected from Alison. And he says that quite clearly uh, you know, to Cliff at some point in the play. Uh, that you know, his expectations from Helena are quite limited. It's, it's essentially a sexual erotic expectation that he has uh, from Helena, nothing more than that. <clears throat> now, what I would like to do at this point is to focus on a Jimmy Cliff relationship uh, in Look Back in Anger. To, so, to what extent is that relationship just a relationship of friendship, or is there any homoerotic uh, perspective, any homoerotic component that is touched upon in the play but not explored, uh, obviously? Right? Now, it's a very open question, it's a very open uh, kind of an argument to make and one can never really come to a closure, one can never really come to a, a conclusion about this particular topic. Now, from the description we have of Hugh Tanner, uh, which is something that uh, Alison gives us, and, uh, Hugh Tanner being this extreme alpha male that Jimmy sort of worships, but at the same time uh, he treats Hugh as some kind of a toy, uh, you know, and uh, w w when he introduced Hugh and Alison to each other, uh, it seemed as if to Alison that he was throwing off two toys to each other. 
So again, that particular uh, bit in Lubeck in anger is quite complex because that sort of hints at the, at, the, at the possibility of maybe some kind of a homoerotic tension, a homoerotic angle uh, between Jimmy and, and Hugh. And remember this, this nonsense rhyme, this nonsense poem that Jimmy sang at one point of time in Lubeck in anger where he says quite clearly, I'm tired of being a hetero, rather ride on a metro where he uh, sort of talks about celibacy, uh, his hatred of women, uh, his misogyny, and how uh, there the are occasions where he says that, you know, he's envious of the Greek chorus boys to Andrew Guide, um, you know. So, you know, because, you know, these people, the Greek chorus boys obviously represent uh, or symbolize homosexuality. Uh, Andrew Guide, uh, you know, and the, the playwright, the French playwright, uh, he was a homosexual. So these references, these allusions to look back in anger, these homoerotic allusions to look back in anger, opens it up even further uh, from the perspective of uh, gender studies. So to what extent is Jimmy's uh, you know, anger uh, you know, a bit of a disguise for homoeroticism? Uh, maybe he's trying to masquerade as this angry alpha male uh, who is actually a, a homosexual but he can't really come out of uh, his closet. Uh, that's the possibility which is sort of hinted at in the black in anger but never quite articulated in the course of the play, like many other things. And that's the, these, these are the things which make the play so interesting uh, and complex because we have these hints, we have these very subtle suggestions, we have these sort of very, um, you know, uh, little insights into people's minds, uh, into people's uh, sentiments, emotions, without really articulating what they are totally feeling. So this lack of totality in the play uh, at a symbolic, dramatic uh, level, but also a level of embodiment and level of characterization uh, is what makes the play a very, very complex uh, you know, piece of theatre. Uh, we never quite know the motives of the characters, we never quite know you know, what drives the characters, what makes them angry, what makes them passive, uh, what makes them happy, uh, what, you know, makes them melancholy. So these are things which are, there's no objective correlative to a certain extent uh, to, some time, to some of the sentiments that look back in anger. And in some sense, look back in anger may be read uh, as something, as a, as a piece of drama which appears to anticipate absurdist theatre. Uh, because remember, this is a time, Latin 56, uh, which is sort of the beginning of the absurdist movement uh, in theatre. So, you know, very quickly we have Waiting for Godot uh, in the next few years and we have this sort of rich range of absurdist dramatists who will come in and uh, who will break away from the normative tradition of sentiments, articulation, logic, etc. So, look back in anger, toys with logic on certain occasions. So, look back in anger, toys with normativity at a certain point in the play. It toys with normative understandings of gender and gendered behavior and gendered articulation at various points in the play, right? And that's what makes the play a very, very interesting piece of study, especially if you're looking at it from a gender studies perspective, right? So melancholia in the back in anger is very masculine melancholia. The anger in look back in anger is very masculine in, in anger. So anger becomes a strategy, a verbal strategy, a verbal device, uh, you know, to attack, uh, to sort of defend the man you know, to, to sort of create this politics of denial, this politics of procrastination that Jimmy has, because we never quite see him do anything. Uh, and obviously, uh, as a feminist, uh, you know, the obvious question that, that one may ask, one should ask, uh, is that why does it take it out on a woman? Because, you know, his entire frustration, uh, his social frustration, his professional frustration, his lack of success socially, uh, Culturally, he seems to take it out on the woman. So again, the woman's body becomes the vessel, not just of violence, but also against masculine unfulfillment. Right? The fact that he cannot fulfill himself as a man, uh, you know, socially, professionally, you know, that becomes uh, so that is transferred onto the body of the female, which uh, which accounts for the visceral violence in Lubbock in anger, which is sort of packed into the, the verbal strategies, you know, the verbal rhetoric uh, in the play uh, as the play progresses. Uh, so, you know, all these things come together to make this play a really complex study of gender. Now, coming on to, uh, sort of moving on to uh, this Jimmy um, Allison relationship and from there to Jimmy Helena relationship. So, as I mentioned, uh, Helena Charles becomes a very clear embodiment of performativity in the play because she sort of becomes appears as a professional actress and then becomes Jimmy's uh, seductress and becomes um, his mistress and then goes back to being the Christian woman, the model Christian woman, uh, all very quickly uh, in the course of the play. Again, uh, you know, dramatizing this very complex relationship between gender and moral values and value system and morality and Christianity, etc. Right? So let's look at the scene where, uh, you know, Alison comes back in the play, right, having lost a child. 
uh, and the possibility of becoming a mother again. So she comes back completely broken in a way which is not dissimilar to the kind of brokenness Jim experienced when he saw his father dying after the Spanish Civil War. So the Spanish Civil War may be read as a political phenomenon which broke Jimmy, Jimmy's, I mean Jimmy Porter's father. Uh, it broke him medically, culturally, ideologically and at a human level. And the violence that Alison goes through, the violence that Alison experiences uh, as a woman in Lubbock in anger breaks her as well. You know, and, and, but, but the interesting thing is uh, the very masculinist kind of take that uh, Alison's experience uh, you know, appears to have. So she comes back almost apologetically uh, to Jimmy, uh, you know, saying that uh, you know, she's, she's hoping that Jimmy would take her back. She's hoping that uh, Jimmy would understand uh, and empathize with her now, now that she's suffered. So again, her whole suffering seems to be mediated by the male gaze, which is a very problematic thing, right? Because that completely effaces or takes away her female agency. Right? So as a feminist, uh, one would be really outraged at this kind of a reading of Lubbock and Anger. The woman comes back having lost a child and apologizes uh, to her husband and tells him that now I'm equal to you, now you can treat me as an equal because I have suffered. I have known what suffering is and I've learned this lesson in life which makes me an equal, which makes me your match right now. And the husband takes her back very, very graciously, uh, you know, thinking that now she is fit enough or you know, superior enough or having suffered enough, she's human enough uh, to be taken in as a wife. Now this reading is deeply sexist, is deeply misogynistic, is deeply problematic at various levels. But that is a reading which does happen in Lubbock in anger that seems to be uh, on the surface, when Alison comes back and begs Jimmy uh, to understand her and tells him that you know uh, she's hoping now that Jimmy would ex Jimmy would know that she has suffered quite as much as he did, uh, and so she understands what suffering is. So suffering again uh, becomes a very gendered phenomenon. This is the point that I'm trying to sort of I was trying to come at, and now I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this uh, to uh, you know connecting it to the way uh, how rage anger is gendered, how rhetoric is gendered, how language is gendered and look back in anger. So suffering too becomes a very gendered phenomenon. So suffering is something which is only experienced, which can only be understood in completion by the male in look back in anger. That appears to be the reading. So again, uh, this, this is rampant sexism, just like language is male, violence is male, the rhetoric of rage is male, suffering too becomes almost a sacred male experience. Jimmy had suffered and that had uh, apparently uh, elevated him as a human being. So he had suffered uh, the you know, death of his father. So again, it's, it's a complete male circuit of suffering, right? So the dying father uh, had sort of talked to the uh, you know, lost or confused child, confused boy, and the two men shared a certain kind of suffering, a certain structure of suffering, which elevates Jimmy Porter, uh, you know, apparently elevates Jimmy Porter as some kind of a superior human being. Now, uh, Alison having lost a child, uh, so she sort of says that I too have suffered now, so I too am male enough to a certain extent, to be accommodated, to be loved by Jimmy Porter. And that kind of reading, which is uh, something which happens a lot in Shakespeare's plays. So, you know, you, you find in Shakespeare's plays, certain times, the very problematic male relationships are formed around women, where women are used as uh, sort of commodities, as buffers, as connecting links uh, between men, between uh, manly sentiments. And, and a classic case in point is Merchant of Venice, where the relationship between Antonio and Bassanio which is quite clearly a homoerotic relationship, is mediated through the woman, through the woman's body, through the woman's appearance. And of course, as you know, those of us uh, who have read the play know that at the end of the play where you know, uh, uh, Bassanio gives away um, his wedding ring uh, to Portia, uh, which disguises Balthazar, uh, that symbolically uh, means, that symbolically uh, you know, reveals quite clearly that you know, uh, she, he is quite prepared to let go of his heterosexual bond of his marriage contract uh, with a woman uh, for, the, for the sake of the male lover, right? So that completely jeopardizes the, the erotic economy in, the, in, in, in Merchant of Venice. Um, like many of Shakespeare's play, uh, the, the erotic economy in Merchant of Venice is very plastic, it's very superficial, it's very fragile. We talked a little bit about Twelfth Night earlier uh, um, as a subtext in the course of this play, uh, in the course of this particular uh, course, and we've seen how Twelfth Night Tomb is a very interesting play in that respect. Now, a similar kind of thing happens in Lubbock in Anger as well. So, the, the, the reading that uh, Alison su supposedly gives 
uh, at the end of the play to uh, Jimmy when she comes back is the fact that she has suffered now and she suffered enough to be manly. She suffered enough to be counted as Jimmy's companion. Right? And Jimmy can take her now because uh, she has elevated herself to suffering. The suffering physical suffering, spiritual suffering, emotional suffering, all these become very, very male strategies of superiority, very, very male strategies of elevation, right? Uh, and that is deeply problematic because, you know, we have seen how Alison has suffered physically, verbally, viscerally in the course of the play. But that did not count as suffering because that came from Jimmy Porter. So suffering is something which happens internally and that internal suffering uh, through the process of losing one's child, which is obviously a traumatic experience, that makes up uh, that sort of mans her up to a certain extent uh, and that makes um, uh, you know, a, you know a, a, a fit companion a compatible companion uh, to Jimmy Porter which is again a very deeply problematic reading in look back in anger right so again this is a point that I want to sort of stress a little bit how suffering is gendered in look back in anger and to what extent is that is connected to rage to anger uh, to the other effects uh, in the play which are deeply gendered as well Right? So when Alison comes back uh, at the end of um, the play, uh, what we find is a very interesting conversation between the two women. Uh, and again, the fact that Jimmy occupies the entire space, the entire verbal space between the two women uh, shows the gender politics in Lou Back in Anger, which is a deeply masculine kind of a politics, where the male is always present, where the male never goes away, uh, even when the two women talk to each other can fight to each other, uh, it is always about the man. It is always about the man in the other room who is playing a trumpet or has gone out or whatever. Right? So the man is always present. So he's like this overseeing presence in Look Back in Anger, uh, Jimmy Porter. He never leaves the room symbolically. He's always there in the room in Look Back in Anger. And that makes them a really, you know, a sort of dominant, overseeing, omnipotent, omnipresent male uh, character in the play. So when the two women talk to each other, it's very interestingly, uh, you know, they tell each other, they agree with each other that Jimmy is born, you know, way out of his time. So he's someone who should be born, they say, uh, during the time of French Revolution, uh, during the time of great political movements uh, where he would have excelled, he would have flourished as a figure, right? Uh, but because it's, it's living in a time which doesn't offer him the opportunity for political action, uh, he's sort of dwindled and he's claustrophobic and he's sort of He's suffering because of that, which obviously is not quite true at all. Because as I mentioned at the very beginning of the play, this play was written at the time where some very important political events were taking place. This was the beginning of the Cold War. This was the time of the Swiss Canal Crisis, where this you know virtual war between England and Egypt was taking place because of President Nasser's um, uh, decision to block the Swiss Canal uh, for the British ships. This is a time which was the beginning of the Falklands War between England and Argentina. So there are certain very interesting and important significant political events happening at that point of time. It's just that Jimmy doesn't engage with those political levels, with those political actions. There's no mention of any of these events in the play. And all it does is it looks back uh, in a very romantic reified kind of a past. Now use the word reified deliberately over here. This is what Jimmy does. Uh, so he takes a past as one monolithic organic entity where everything was rosy and nice and lovely. Uh, and he compares that to his very, very, uh, you know, disappointing uh, and depressing present, uh, and which he finds completely insufficient uh, for his masculinity, which is obviously a very strategic thing. Because if he really engages with the present, there are things he can engage with and look back in anger. Uh, there are certain political phenomena which he can engage with quite easily in the course of the play, but it doesn't. So what does it do instead? He does a sort of a denial strategy. He does a very strategic kind of a prevaricative uh, method whereby he completely converts the past as one organic, monolithic, rosy entity where everything was abundant, everything was lovely, everything was flourishing and he compares and contrasts that to the very, very sorry present in which he finds himself to be living uh, and suffering. And the women seem to subscribe to this. Uh, so Alison and Helena, they talk to each other and they seem to subscribe to this uh, appearance of Jimmy, that he is someone who is born out of his time. Uh, like Hamlet, and you know, we, we get to see this thing about Hamlet as well, that he, he sort of pretends to be someone uh, who was born either ahead of his time or after his time. And it doesn't quite fit in in a temporal landscape uh, of Denmark. 
that he finds himself inhabiting. And we find a similar kind of situation in Lubbock in Anger, where, where, where uh, Jimmy Porter doesn't seem to fit in the temporal landscape or the temporal cosmos of England, which doesn't really offer him any opportunity to be glorious, to be heroic, to be whatever. Right? And, and he says at one point in the play that if you die over here, it will not be a glorious death anymore. It will be like stepping in front of a bus. Is as inglorious, as banal, as mundane as stepping in front of a bus. So all the brave good causes are gone. There are no brave good causes left. In other words, uh, he says quite clearly through this particular line that he cannot really become a masculine hero anymore. So his the, the, the possibility of heroic masculinity is frustrated. The possibility of heroic masculinity is gone in the course of the play because of the political conditions in which he finds himself stuck in. Now that is obviously a very, very uh, complex uh, thing to say because the women say, the women subscribe to it, the women support him, the women say he should have been born in the French Revolution, they can picture him uh, as a crusader uh, for liberty, equality, fraternity and all the lovely things of the French revolutions. So he fits into that particular image quite easily. But he seems to be struggling uh, to come to terms with his present and, and they agree, the two women that will never do anything or never amount to anything, right? So again, the, the, the insufficient masculinity of Jimmy Porter, the inglorious masculinity of Jimmy Porter, sort of defended to a certain extent by, uh, you know, relocating him uh, into some kind of a rosy past where he could have been someone. We obviously, we'd never know whether he could have been that. We never know, we will never know whether he could have been a crusader, whether he could have been a radical, whether he could have been a hero. Uh, he probably wouldn't have become a hero in any circumstances because there are certain, certainly opportunities for him to engage in political action at this present as well. But he doesn't do it. He screams from his armchair. He subjects his wife to violence, verbal violence, visceral violence, and it keeps sort of condensing the past into one organic entity of rosy revolutions and opportunities which are exhausted now. And the present he looks at, he looks at the present as some kind of an exhausted entity, exhausted entity, uh, which he finds himself completely stuck in. So again, uh, it's interesting to see how even time is gendered and looked back in anger, right? The past is a male past, right? The past is a, uh, you know, a space for possibilities, uh, for promises, for revolutions, for abundance, uh, for lovely things, uh, you know, things which are gone now, right? So the present right now is insufficient. The present is sort of quote unquote emasculated. The present is a, a space for frustration, for cynicism, etc. Right? So again, this is deeply gendered. So the very potent, the potency of the past is sort of deliberately contrasted with the importance of the present. Right? Uh, and this is the imagination of Lubbock in Anger, the imagination of Jimmy Porter in Lubbock in Anger, which the woman in Lubbock in Anger also seem to subscribe to. But we need to look at a play from a more complex perspective. We, we sort of, so we need to step out of the, uh, the, the mindscape of Jimmy Porter and look at the play from outside his mind to really locate him, to really situate him uh, in his present and to sort of study him as a gendered phenomenon, uh, you know, in terms of his negotiation with the present. So, so to what extent does it negotiate with his present uh, politically emotionally, uh, you know, uh, at, a, at an existential level, does it really engage with the present at all? Does it negotiate with the present at all? Or does it take it out? Does it, does it take out his failure, his bitterness, his cynicism uh, on the most easily available side, which is the body of the woman, which is really something which is attacked over and over again in look back in anger, verbally, viscerally, culturally, emotionally, uh, in all sorts of ways, right? And that sort of uh, culminates into the loss of Alison's child, the fact that she loses the ability uh, to produce a child. She goes through a miscarriage uh, and we, we, we're given a hint that she will probably never become a mother again. So this attack on the woman, this, this violence on the woman, uh, this becomes uh, sort of quite symbolically, you know, present in Alison's condition at the end of the play. So Alison's condition at the end of the play may be seen, may be read uh, as an example of the violence on the woman, the violence suffered by the woman. But also notice how, as was mentioned just a little while earlier, how does violence suffered by the woman is sort of made sacred to a certain extent and articulated by the woman herself, which is even deeply shocking in the context of look back in anger. So she sort of comes back to uh, Jimmy and says, now that I've suffered, uh, you know, now that I've gone through uh, a really deep spiritual suffering, uh, physical, emotional, medical, spiritual suffering, now probably I can be a compatible companion for you. Uh, you, the great man, you should take me back. Uh, you know, you should sort of accommodate me back. 
uh, now I'm a fitting companion for you, uh, having suffered. So again, look at the way how the violence on a woman is almost legitimized uh, and it's al it almost becomes a necessary compulsory condition uh, for the elevation of the woman. It's almost like a lesson of the woman, right? The, the, the lesson the woman needs to go through, the lesson the woman needs to uh, experience in order to be as good as men, as good as the protagonist, the manly protagonist in the play. Now this deeply sexist, problematic, misogynistic reading of look back in anger is something which we must resist. And this is the reason why I'm saying why don't you step out of Jimmy Porter's imagination and look at the play from a broader cultural political perspective uh, as a play uh, of lost opportunities but also of violences. And the chief recipient of the violence in the back in anger is the woman, is Alison Redfern, who I think personally is the most complex character in the play, the most helpless character in the play, uh, you know, the most tragic character in the play uh, in Look Back in Anger. And a tragedy lies in the fact exactly the fact that she doesn't quite know, she doesn't see herself as a tragic character. And also notice the way in which there's an attempt made by the woman again, ironically, to confer the tragic hero status on Jimmy Porter in the end. So they're sort of telling each other that, you know, he should have been born in the time of the French Revolution, he should have been uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, he should have been Percy Bessie Shelley uh, and I and Alison at some point says that he wanted to be Shelley and he doesn't understand why I am not Mary Shelley uh, and, and you're not William Godwin this is what he says she says to her father so again the whole attempt made by the the play uh, at least on, on a superficial level is to glorify Jimmy is to romanticize Jimmy uh, as this misdirected misfired masculine presence but you know, if you read the play from an objective gender perspective, from a broader, a more complex gender perspective, we find that this is an attempt uh, made by the man really uh, to cover up for his own inadequacies, to confer his inadequacies on the woman, uh, to transfer bitternesses, bitternesses lack of success, social success, professional success, onto the body of the woman, right, who becomes a very passive recipient of it and also to a certain extent subscribes to it, right. So she sort of subscribes to uh, this kind of uh, uh, transferring strategy by the male. Uh, and the heroism in Look Back in Anger is sort of uh, almost entirely centered on, on, on Jimmy Porter, which again is deeply problematic because, you know, if you read the play from a complex gender perspective, the most tragic character is undoubtedly Alison Redfern in Look Back in Anger. But we, we don't see that in the end. The entire the ending of Look Back in Anger, it sort of very, very assiduously tries to sort of make Jimmy into some kind of a tragic hero, some kind of a romantic tragic hero who can now live a life of resignation, of submission, uh, having lost a glorious battle, etc. Now, all this taken together is, in my mind, a cover up, uh, really, uh, for sort of a cover up for the inadequacies of Jimmy's gendered identity. Right? Uh, so he becomes a failed father, he becomes a failed husband, he becomes a failed professional, and he becomes a failed person uh, you know, at an existential level. Now all these failures uh, are sort of transferred over to the woman uh, very conveniently. And ironically, this kind of transfer is subscribed by the woman and voiced and articulated by the woman at the end of Look Back in Anger. So, you know, taken together, a failure becomes a gendered phenomenon, right? So the man can never fail. This failure is quickly transferred over to the woman uh, who now looks at the failure as some kind of a spiritual elevation for her to come to terms with uh, the man, uh, you know, uh, to become as good as a man, to become as spiritual as a man, to become as existentially rich as a man. And now she comes back uh, and sort of reconciles and begs uh, admission uh, to the man as well who happily takes her back. Right? Uh, now that this kind of reading is obviously deeply problematic, offensive at many levels, but you know, I think this is a reading which we need to do in Look Back in Anger, rather than read the play as some kind of a romantic ending where uh, Alison and Jimmy uh, get back to each other. We need to understand the suffering of the woman. We need to understand how the suffering is sort of how the woman really doesn't see that as a suffering. She sees that as an elevation because she's brainwashed into doing it by the man. She sees that as an elevation uh, for her to become as good as the man. Uh, and that's sort of in her mind that makes her a sort of a, a deserving, an accommodating person that makes her someone who can come back to Jimmy Porter and be as good as Jimmy, which is a very deeply problematic thing in my mind. Right? So again, one needs to look at look back in anger from these various perspectives of gender and gender identity, not just a level of identity, but also a level of effect, or the level of emotion, the level of sentiment. So how do sentiments in look back in anger become deeply gendered and mapped across in a very deeply gendered kind of 
away. Sentiments such as resignation, pain, loss, alienation. How do these things become conveniently gendered and look back in anger? And how the whole play in the end uh, tries to make Jimmy into some kind of a tragic character and some kind of a tragic hero, which it clearly isn't. Uh, in my mind, right? The only tragic character in Look Back in Anger, the most tragic character perhaps in Look Back in Anger is Alison Redfern and the tragedy is she doesn't know it, right? So this concludes this lecture. We'll have one more lecture on Look Back in Anger and we will just discuss the play uh, overall as a gendered phenomenon and we'll obviously uh, sort of reiterate some of the things which I've already said but we'll also connect it to some of the plays like Ibsen's Doll's House uh, and also some of the uh, absurdist plays which will come up later in the works of Samuel Beckett, Eugene Ionesco and Harold Pinta. Uh, but you know, this is something I've mentioned in, in passing today, that how Look Back in Anger appears to anticipate uh, at a dramatic level, a theatrical level, uh, you know, these absurd experiments, absurdist experiments with theatre which would come up in subsequent years. But in the next lecture, I'll connect Look Back in Anger to some of the uh, you know, social gendered uh, issues in theatre which were pervading European theatre even before Look Back in Anger. Uh, you know, I'll mention um, you know, uh, Ibsen's Doll's House to a certain extent, but also look at how, the, how at, at a formal innovative level, Look Back in Anger is, is a very important play, uh, especially in the way it sort of has a very complex manifestation of gender, uh, not just a level of identities, but also a level of sentiments, apparatus, rhetoric, um, you know, emotions uh, and affect uh, overall in the, in the course of the play, right? So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next class where we conclude Look Back in Anger as a drama. Thank you.